Thank you, and thank you everyone for your patience. So I think we can start and hope this stays steady for us. This is the excitement of working from home for all of us. Uh, mm. I'm Nicola Solomon. I'm the Chief Executive of the Society of Authors. And thanks for joining the second in our afternoon tea series, which are running for the next 12 weeks. As you know, all our sessions are free. But if you could afford to donate a few pounds to the Authors Emergency Fund to support authors in need at this time, we'd be very grateful. And we'll be putting a link to that in the chat box. So we're very, very lucky, and we can see we've got 500 people here, as excited as we are, to have as our guest this week, Philip Foreman, uh, who is the SOA's president. Now, the only thing I'm really regretting, Philip, is that I'm not actually in your house for tea, not only because you're lovely, but anyone knows who knows Philip knows that he makes the best tea. He makes really, really good tea. So I'm sorry not to be seeing him in person, but I also think that Squeezing 500 people into your into your room is going to be quite complicated. Well, we'd uh, be a bit crowded, wouldn't we? But today's format is I'm going to have a quick intro from me about Philip, as if he needed one. Then we're going to chat for about 30 minutes. Then we're going to have... You've even got the tea and I haven't. It's not fair. And then we're going to have about 15 minutes of questions. If you want to submit any questions during the session, just type them in and we'll try to get to them at the end. So, Sir Philip Paulman, born in Norwich in 1946, educated in England, Zimbabwe and Australia before settling in North Wales, went on to Exeter College, Oxford to read English, although I think you said, Philip, that you never learned to read it very well. Yes. You um, found your way into the teaching profession in 1971 at the age of 25, uh, taught at various Oxford middle schools, working full time. Your first public work was in 1972, but I think you don't talk about that. You wrote a number of short stories and other books, then moved to Westminster College in 1986 and spent eight years involved in teaching students on the B.Ed. course, writing more books and then writing more time after publication of Northern Lights in 1995. On my count, but not anyone else's count, you've written over 30 books, including plays, short stories, essays, comics, graphic novels, um, I've got a few behind me of the ones that people might not have seen, and um, but you're best known for His Dark Materials and the follow-up Book of Dust. You've won more prizes than anybody could have known, and I've got time to list. You've been our president of the Society of Authors since 2013, and we really appreciate it. You've spearheaded some of our most successful campaigns, including PLR and eBooks, and resigning from the Oxford Literary Festival, to support the principle of payment for authors for festivals and you were knighted last year in 2019. So can you start by giving us a short tour of your workspace and your creative routine? You gave us a quick preview before and we'd love to look around again. Yes, yes. if I don't okay. drop the camera, um, I'm happy to do that. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Good, can... okay. Well, I'm sitting in my um, workroom now, which is at the top of the house. It's a little attic room and um, I can turn one way and look out of the window and see, um, well, see some trees, occasionally see a, a red kite zooming past or even the village heron having a, a, a fly out from the pond. Um, if I turn the other way, we, we can begin to see how small this room is and also what an extraordinary mess it is. Um, it didn't even tidy up for it. I wouldn't know where anything was if I started tidying up. It's the, it's the problem of horizontal surfaces. Um, if I see a horizontal surface, um, I put something on it. For example, there's a ship that I'm making at the top there. There's some, um, well, books and books and books. On the chair next to me, which I'm trying to find, there we are, that's a chair under a pile of books. These are all the books that I'm using at the moment. And um, by using, I mean, what am I looking at now? Um, that was my binoculars there. Binoculars are because I have a map of the world opposite me in front of those bookshelves. Um, and I need that because uh, Lyra in the latest book is going from um, Oxford to Central Asia. And she needs to know where to go next. And I need to know where she's going to go next. So I've got a map of the world. Um, and I hung it up there, but the trouble is it's too far away to see. Um, but it's so big that if I put it on the desk, 
I wouldn't have room to have anything else. So I got these binoculars. <laughs> these are these are close focusing binoculars and they're wonderful because you can use them to focus on a on a butterfly or a bee or a map of um, Mongolia or whatever that's only a couple of feet away. Um, they're very useful if you if you're looking at insects and flowers, but I'm using it at the moment to look at my map of the world. Um, what else is there in here? Oh, my desk itself. Well, let's see if I can turn the camera around. Well, um, that's um, right in front of me. That's my space where I'm writing. There's the um, manuscript, the latest manuscript, which I'm... Oh, that's so exciting. About two thirds of the way down the page. So I've got a bit more to do today. Outside the window, you can hear, well, I can hear, maybe you can hear, a plane going past because we're right under the flight path to Rise Norton. And every day these great lumbering things go past. Um, we, 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 I presume they're coming, they're, they're transport planes bringing um, uh, medical equipment, I hope they are, from all parts of the world. Um, and that's really, I mean, I've got all sorts of other things on here. I can't work without all kinds of clutter. I know um, that you have a particular routine when you with with your paper and pencils, isn't that right? Oh yeah. Ruling lines. Will you tell us about that? Yes. When I I can only write on one <laughs> I can only write on one sort of paper, which is this um, lined paper with two holes in it, A4 paper. Uh, but I, I've got to. There's a sort of ritual I've got to go through to to um, what's the word I want to dedicate the paper to to this particular book so at the top right hand corner I'm sorry I'm um, waving this about all over the place top right hand corner I color the paper um, a different color for each book this is a sort of sandy red color terracotta e color and um, then the, the, I can only use that paper for this book and it mustn't be used for anything I'm sorry to wave you about like this um, maybe I can find a steady place to put it so that's one of the things I do. I always write with the same pen, which um, actually I got two of these, and I lost one recently. No, you can't and do that, Chris. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, it, it lives in a little green case, and I used to have it in my bag and, and, and sign books with it and so on. And um, and this other one is up here, but I lost a little green case, and um, people were very kind because I wrote about it on Twitter. And people were very kind and offered to look for it and what have you. And then it turned up because I put it in the pocket of a jacket I don't wear very often. And that's where it was. Um, what else have I got here? Oh, there's um, there's uh, Buddha over there. There's, yes, there it is. Um, there's um, a, a lovely little book um, thing that looks like a ship. Two, two bookends. Gorgeous. That um, are carrying between them a lot of maps specifically about Central Asia, various parts and spaces in Central Asia. Maps are awfully good. Maps are, are, are a, a great resource. I discovered how useful they are many years ago when I was writing a book called The Ruby and the Smoke, which is set in Victorian London in 1872. That's a wonderful series. <laughs> you can thank you. And you can get um, ordnance survey maps of the time every street every house every little back alley is is there and um as it was in 1872 and i could sort of put my character on this corner of the, the street and say if they, if they were looking down that way they could see such and such but they didn't see him coming because he was coming down half moon street around the corner or whatever it was so maps are all awfully awfully useful so you have to be physically grounded in your head to write something, even if it's fantasy or so-called, because I know you don't necessarily like that term. Well, I like, when I'm reading, I like to know where we are. So I remember I'm reading a book and they don't tell me where we are. I'm a bit frustrated by that. So I like to know where we are, who's present, what time of day it is, what the weather's like, um, where the light's coming from. What you could see if you were in there. These are all things, of course, that the camera gives you in a film. If you point a camera at a room and people in it, it sees everything and you can sort of choose what you want to look at. A skillful director will direct your attention by one means or another to the to where the story's going on. 
but I like to know those things. And uh, so I try and make sure that when I'm writing a scene, as I'm doing at the moment, which is set in a, um, a rather expensive cafe uh, somewhere in Syria, um, not our Syria, but a different Syria in Lyra's world, I need to know what it would be like if I were there. So, yeah, I do like a sort of particularity. And how's it going? And this is a question I know that if, well, these 519 people have logged in to know the answer to. How is this book going and when are you going to get it finished and out to us? Well, I'm going to get it finished. Um, <laughs> well, th th there are several, several things. Here. One is it's kind of quite a long book. Yes. I can guarantee it will not be as long as the third part of Hilary Mantel's series. Wonderful, though. Um, I haven't read it. And I've resisted reading it because a particular thing about I, I just don't like reading books in the present tense. Oh, of course, yes, I know. And um, so I've I do admire Hilary Mantel enormously, especially her book Beyond Black, which I quoted as saying, I think is the best ghost story in the language. But I I, I really can't face um, Thomas Cromwell for th thousands of pages in the present tense. That's my fault, not hers. So, um, so you showed us two thirds down a page. You're going to share with us how far, how many pages that is through the book so far. <laughs> um, hmm. Well, if I hold up this um, thing quite close, maybe you'll be able to see the page number. Forty-eight. That's right, but that doesn't mean very much because this is a first draft, and of course it's going to get cut and added to and altered and pushed around, but. That's um, th that's where I am in this in this sort of first draft stage. I, actually, I don't like thinking about first first drafts yeah. and so on because every time I write a sentence, I want it to stay writ. So I don't think, oh, this is only a first draft. I don't have to bother very much with this. I can always correct it later. Um, every time I write a sentence, I don't. I, that's the last time I want to write it. But um, you know, what's your routine? Do you have to write a certain amount every day? Before, and what sort of time do you start writing? Well, uh, I've long ago, uh, and it must be now I think of it, must be over 50 years ago, I discovered that um, my rate of production is or was anyway, three pages, three sort of A4 pages a day. In my handwriting, that's about a thousand words. Um, I'm finding with this book, various reasons that I've slowed up a bit, partly because um, of the lockdown business, which isn't as convenient as it might seem, um, because I seem to have a lot of things to do around the house. So I was going to ask about that. What has changed for you because of lockdown and, and does it make it easier or harder? It's, you know, it's twofold. It's made it easier in a way because my diary is blank, blessedly blank. <laughs> Except for us interfering with you and asking to come for tea, yes. Yeah. Um, so in a way it's easy. In another way it's not so easy because I miss the things that used to lubricate the writing. I used to like going into into Oxford and finding a cafe and sitting and working there. Um, the, there used to be a cafe I used to go to in, in the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford, which was it, it was it was down in the basement then. It's moved now, and it's not so not so conducive to writing. But I, I'd go there every time I was had a, stuck with a narrative, you know crux or something and I'd go there and have a cup of their coffee and it would sort itself out so I, li I like doing that sort of thing and I, I like um, wandering about staring at things and looking at ducks on the river and all that kind of stuff which isn't so easy now so life is circumscribed but I'm not complaining I'm extremely lucky Jude and I my wife and I are very lucky to live where we do and um, to have enough space to, to walk around in We've got a bit of land behind the house and we walk the dogs there. Um, how people are managing uh, who, who don't have space to walk in of their own and who have a house, well, with children in it, I don't know. My heart bleeds for them. It's a terrible, terrible situation. Inevitably, inevitably it'll, it'll force us as a society, I think, when it's over, to look at the way we govern ourselves and the way we way we organize ourselves as a as a nation as a people as a society and change a change a great deal of it 
Well, I, one of the things that, that just leading on from children that I thought was I've been thinking about with lockdown is you've always maintained a, a passionate interest in education. I think mm. you said it leads you occasionally to make foolish and ill-considered remarks alleging that not everything is well in, in our schools. Um, and you've always been concerned about testing and leak tables. But now we've got a generation of children for a while being schooled at home by their parents with yeah. no doesn't how do you think that's going to affect children and how do you do you think that that's going to be a, even for this small time how are they going to think about it there'll be a fortunate few who will look back on it as a time of great happiness and excitement um for most children i guess it's by now it's becoming wearisome and boring and enormously frustrating and there are some unfortunate children who will be suffering quite a lot um, it, children don't just learn from the syllabus. They don't just learn from the textbooks. They learn from the personality of the teacher as well. But if the teacher is um, a, a sort of open-minded, in intelligent, curious person, um, who interested in a lot of things, that, that will be communicated to the children in their class. And also children learn from one another. Uh, I remember that a great deal of my education at my secondary school was carried out in the passionate discussions I used to have with my friends and um, contemporaries about one thing and another. For example, the um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember vividly uh, going out into the it was a sort of bleak, cold October day, and I remember going out into the um, playground and nobody could talk about anything except what was happening across the Atlantic as the Russian ships were steaming closer and closer to Cuba where they were going to land their missiles, what was going to happen? Um, I, I learned from that experience of, I, I learned about sharing political concerns with my contemporaries and um, realizing that by discussion, you could, you could learn quite a lot about, not only about the situation, but about oneself, about how one um, marshals an argument and you could learn from other people how to how to make a point more clearly and more effectively all that sort of stuff which you which which requires a large number of people around you can't get that on, on, on you know at home when you're locked down and how are you connecting now because you're missing that too oh well i've done most of my learning of that sort <laughs> um in any case, we can still we can still commu communicate what this would be like without um, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, and and things like Zoom and so on. It would be awful. It would be dreadful. But Twitter is a uh, Twitter is a great um, um, enabler of communication. I, I enjoy Twitter enormously. Yeah, I must say that actually at the time this happened, fortuitously or not fortuitously, I was reading Philip Ziegler's The Black Death, and uh, and there you literally didn't know what was happening in the next village. And that's a very different world. Oh, very different. You must have felt really, really isolated in, um, in, a, in, a, in a very profound way. Yes, I think so. And what inspires you? You talked a bit about looking at the ducks and wandering around. Um, what inspires you? For you, you know, this is a huge work, all your works, but particularly this is a huge, you know, dark huge work of the imagination i don't want to ask that trite question about where you get it all from but what's what inspires you i don't know um my usual trite answer to this question is i don't know where my ideas come from but i know where they come to they come to my desk and if i'm not here they go away again um habit is a great resource habit is the writer's best friend habit has written more books than um, inspiration ever has if you form the habit early on in your writing career of going to the same place at the same time every day and writing a certain number of words, don't you, 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 it doesn't matter about inspiration. Don't worry if you're not feeling inspired. Just get it down. You can always work on it later. Um, and it, it, I've always found that if I'm, if I'm stuck, um, I just stay here and stare at the map of the world or stare out of the window or something. Be in the same place at the same time every day. That's the best way of uh, thinking of enough things to fill a book. And what's the time for you when you do that? Do you have a specific in the morning. Time? Yeah. In the morning. Um, when I was working full time, which I was up to the age of uh, 40, 
40 plus something. Um, I tried all sorts of things. I, tr I tried to get up very early in the morning and write then, but I, I couldn't do that. In the end, I discovered that the thing to do was to go to school, get to, to, to go to work, teach my classes, come home, have a bite of supper, do the, you know, mark my books and plan the next day. And then finally go upstairs to the little room in the attic in the house we lived in then and um, write around midnight. That's that's what I had to do then. But now I, I find I, I work my best in the morning. And then when you're not working, you have hobbies and one of your hobbies is woodwork and I noticed that you had something if you've got something you can show us that you're working on now you did offer to take us down to a workroom but I was a bit scared about you falling down the stairs with your iPad <laughs> sure this is such a great plan but you make such beautiful things well I, I, I do like making things out of wood um all sorts of reasons I, I discovered it's something I can do and it's a physical thing uh so it engages a different part of your mind and your brain it's wood is a lovely material. It feels nice. There's nothing um, that is quite so agreeable uh, in that way as to run a plane, a sharp plane across a piece of wood. And um, you, you just just the, the, the meeting between the steel and the wood is uh, a lovely thing to experience. It's a sensuous pleasure. So, yes, I do that. Um, I've got I've got. This is, this is where I keep my my map of the world looking binoculars. Um, this is a, can you see that there? I'm tilting the, Beautiful. tilting the camera. Through. This is a, this is a little book stand I made. Nice thing about this design, I didn't design it. Um, the design is a sort of 17th century French one or 18th century French one, made out of one plank of wood. And you, you, you cut the, um, you, you chip away at the, the knuckles of the hinge and then you slice down the wood until you can open it up and i'm not filming this very well at all anyway the thing is it does its job and it holds my where am i now there i am it holds my binoculars and you could put a book on it i made one for um a friend the american illustrator wonderful illustrator tommy de paula who died recently and he said thank you very much it's just what i need to put my sandwiches on <laughs> okay fair enough it, it's so beautiful you made us one which which is one of my most loved possessions i must say and, yeah um, um, i made yours out of oak cakes. i think yes it's a I really beautiful of, i made a lovely one out of um walnut for mark haddon recently when he came out of hospital um i i, I wanted to see what it, what it was like working in walnut i like it so much i'm going to make, make more of that of walnut i also make boxes and other small things small things because i'd like to make big things but my workshop isn't very big and it's so cluttered that there's there's the horizontal surfaces again there's too much stuff on my bench top for me to make a chair or a table so i got to clear all that stuff out of the way so in the mean in, in, the, in the meantime i'm making small things like boxes and your other stuff i've noticed is books what are you reading at the moment um i just read a fascinating book which is coming out i think in may this month or something uh, it's called humankind by rutger bregman who's a, a dutch historian uh, and he's um he, he's very much in uh, he's trying to counter the view that hu human beings are greedy selfish and unpleasant and it's a jungle out there and we're all horrible underneath and we've all got to um do the other person down before they do us down he's countering this view with copious um, examples very well cited examples of um, the, the the very opposite um, that I found very interesting I'm also reading a book um, I'm also reading Helen Atkinson's Big Sky which I'm very much enjoying I am about to read um, uh, Mick Heron's new uh, latest note book Joe Country I like Mick Heron a lot I like thrillers of all sorts well I, I like good thrillers bad thrillers I chuck away but um, I, I'm a sucker for thrillers and adventure stories. Yes, I've got a set of detective stories chosen by you here, which I'm uh, about to Oh, right, you. yes, that one I did a long time ago. <laughs> yes, I wanted to call it crime stories because that gave it a more interesting um, a more interesting focus, but the publishers were a bit nervous of that. <laughs> and going on to publishers and the industry, um, yeah. you are, you know, 
thank goodness for, for the Society of Authors members, you're really a passionate advocate of, of the fact that this is a business done for money. I think mm. you, you said expecting authors to work because it is work for nothing is iniquitous. It always has been. I've had enough of it. I think that's what you said when you left the Oxford Literary Festival. What do you think about the industry and how it treats authors? I and mean, particularly, which you must be getting now, about calls on authors to donate time and materials for free? It's, a, it's, it's not an easy it's not an easy position to be in because a lot of the people who are um, asking for you to help by doing something free are good people doing good things yes. or old friends who are asking for something. Um, and, I, you know, one tries to oblige, um, but I wouldn't write a large, you know, a long piece for nothing. Um, the idea is absurd. Um, in general, I think we ought to be paid for doing the work we're doing. It isn't easy work. Most people can't do it because it requires organizing information in a particular way and having a, um, a sensitivity to the nuances of language that many people who are using language professionally don't have. And I mean, people who write manuals of, inst you know, instruction manuals or um, even some journalists or um, you know, certainly politicians who use language professionally all the time. Um, we who are writers, we who are um, entitled to become members of the Society of Authors, do have these uh, slightly unusual skills, and in the we should be rewarded for the exercise of them, the, the proper exercise of them. And in this, um, everyone concerned in the in the industry is is working with the same end. We're not enemies. We're not publishers' enemies. We're not the enemies of critics and reviewers and and booksellers and anybody else. We're all in the same. We're all in the same business, in the same game, in the same ecology, if you like. We're all doing different things. Um, publishers, uh, well, some of my b best and closest friends are publishers. They do what they do extremely well. Um, agents, again, we, we rely very closely on our agents, some of whom become um, close and lifelong friends. You've known Bookseller, quite since university, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. Yes, my own agent, Karada King, um, I met uh, at, at Oxford on the first day of my um, the first day I turned up at that in that institution, um, and we're we're still we're still friends and still working together. Um, uh, booksellers, of course, I'm immensely impressed by and fond of and supportive of independent booksellers, especially. I don't think we should ever, um, I, I, I can't remember if there is an official Society of Authors line on this, but I don't think we should ever have got rid of the net book agreement because it, it placed um, independent booksellers at the mercy of those enormous high volume traders like, um, what's its name? Big River in South America, I can't remember, <laughs> um, who can trade in enormous volumes and demand excruciating discounts and in general um treat books like product and this uh, i don't like that no and this is obviously a really tough time for local bookshops are any of yours operating how are you able to support your local bookshops at this point uh well in oxford um we have a couple of big booksellers there's blackwells and there's waterstones mm. um there was a borders but that appeared and went very quickly uh, the, the, the little bookshop in Summertown, the bookhouse, has had to um, close down, which I'm very sorry about. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a hard time, and I always um, advise uh, other writers to support local bookshops, independent bookshops, wherever you can. Uh, yeah, you don't get the big discount, but, you know. And, and in fact, I mean, Amazon isn't discounting huge now anyway but i think both waterstones and blackwells are still selling online um yeah. even though they've got supply difficulties so that's you know they're they're both people you can support at this yes point, I, I mean buying books online is extraordinary you, you you could go and live in samoa like um robert louis stevenson um and uh be no further away from a bookshelf than your own desk if he had a computer on it you could order books um and they come from all over all around the world it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing but there is a cost, and some of the cost is paid by authors whose 
and 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 of course independent booksellers who's who don't have the facilities to do this don't have the facilities above all to demand huge discounts and you you talked a bit about you were worried about what, what this whole crisis is going to do for society generally do you think it will make any change in publishing and in the industry and what change do you think we would need to make yeah the publishing industry has been going through enormous changes in the last oh 25 30 years it's been one of the most um turmoil driven times in the whole history of publishing and actually the history of publishing isn't that isn't that long really in comparison with the amount of time human beings have been telling stories um we started telling stories as soon as we invented language whenever that was 50,000 60,000 100 year thousand years ago we don't know that was the first great revolution we could tell stories we could use tenses to say this happened we could make stuff up and and, and, and invent things that didn't happen, but were persuasive enough to persuade people that they did happen. Then came the invention of writing things down. Uh, and the storyteller didn't have to be present in the same room or the same cave or the same marketplace anymore. You could write it down and, and somebody else could read it. Then came printing. And you could suddenly um, print enormous quantities of your story or whatever it is and sell them in hundreds of different towns all over the place. Then came um, the 20th century and all the other um, developments, the films, movies, cameras, um, talking pictures, television, the internet, etc. It's all been a series of revolutions. The publishing industry itself began, I suppose, about 200, maybe 250 years ago. Before that, if you were an author, you, you made a contract with a bookseller, not a publisher. And the bookseller would arrange to print it. Um, perhaps he was a printer and bookseller. Arrange to print so many copies of your book and sell it at such and such a, an address. Um, it was only later that publishers came along who sort of took the the editorial function away from from the printer and the bookseller. So publishers haven't been around for very long in the in the in the scheme of things, and their function has changed greatly and will continue to change. Is changing now with the ability to edit and publish your own book without the intervention of a publisher at all. Not a good idea, really, in some cases, because editors do a very good job. Yes, but you can, of course, buy all the services in of independent editors and, and have that kind of thing. Yeah, but, but, but publishing is a, is a great filter as well. You know that if you're going to buy a book that's published by Jonathan Cape or Penguin or any of the established famous publishers, it's going to have gone through a series of quality filters before it gets to the bookshop. Um, if you if you publish it yourself on the internet, we don't have that assurance. And so, well, I, I'm less inclined to look at them in the, in the first place. Yeah, I think it's interesting, but, but there's plenty going on there. And certainly for some people, it really does work if they know their audiences and so on. I, and you work, you were talking about film and other modern inventions. You've had several of your works adapted and you've also done some collaborations. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the TV series or the film? Um, does it concern you to see your works in different media like that? No, not at all. Um, the the <laughs> money is usually quite good. Um, and it's always interesting to see what people... I'm just going to move over here. I get a different view of myself. Um, it's interesting to see what other people do. And sometimes they do very interesting things. When His Dark Materials was done at the National Theatre, for example, Nick Wright, who, Nicholas Wright, who wrote the script, and Nicholas Heitner, who directed it, um, brought a completely different vision to the story. And I can see that's going to happen again with La Belle Sauvage when Nicholas Heitner um, produces that at the Bridge Theatre later this year. It's always exciting to see it enter a different medium. Um, some of these... Uh, some of these media are better at telling stories than others are. Uh, I think the radio, for example, is greatly underestimated, yes. under under appreciated as a teller of stories. But um, I've lost my. Oh, we we oh, spent a lot of time. It was, it was holding. It was holding the iPad up. That's where it was. Uh, <laughs> we spend a lot of time talking about radio drama and fighting for for. Yeah stories to still be told on radio, which is a very important thing. When you moved, you showed us something written behind the back of your head, which oh, we, yeah. you told me you're going to tell us about. Well, um, this 
little sentence. I suppose you could call it an aphorism. Examine todo, retene lo bon is in a made up language, which is obviously partly Spanish. It's the work of an Argentinian painter called Shul Solar, who was a kind of surrealist painter and did um, a lot of making stuff up in every direction. Um, you can see what it means, really. It means, um, lost it, there it is. Examine everything and keep what's good. Now, that seems to me a, quite a good way of proceeding with, one, with one's own work. Yes, and with everything, really. I'm going to ask you one more question from me before I give get some of the ones that have been sent in to us. And this is one. You're a long-term member of the Society of Authors. You're a council member. You've been involved in the management committee. And now you're the president. What does the Society of Authors mean to you? It means that I'm part of a body of people who have experienced the same hopes and um, disappointments and occasional successes as I have um, it's 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 that you can understand immediately when I'm in the company of fellow authors um, we have a we have a lot in common we have a profession in common we have professional um, advice and assistance in common the society does great things in helping sort out contracts and disagreements and, and the sort of problems that always do arise between um, different interests, um, publishers and authors or um, booksellers and publishers, whatever it is. The society does a great job. But um, more than any of those things, more than that business sort of stuff, it's a kind of fellowship. Um, I, what's the membership now? Is it over 10,000 something? Over 11,000 now. Yes. 11,000. Well, that's a great uh, that's a great help as well. You know that you're not alone, really. Um, there's a there's a society that has your interests at heart, that um, understands the problems and the difficulties that you have to engage with in the profession, and exists um, well for mutual mutual help and support. It's a it's a wonderful thing. I think everybody who's in a position to do so should join at once. Good. That's what we like to hear. I'm going to go on to some of the questions we've had from the audience. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is, is definitely a fellowship one because it's some, a long way away from you. But what, uh, this is a question from Holly Race. What advice would you give to debut authors whose books are being released during the lockdown? Uh, it's an unprecedented situation, isn't it? Um, you've got to be talked about, I suppose. That's the main thing. If people are going to hear about your book, they can need it to be talked about. Get, if you're not on Twitter and Facebook and all these other things, um, get yourself on there. You could even sort of tempt people with an extract from your book. That's I, I mean, I'm just, th th these are the things that would be done by someone who were telling stories in the marketplace two thousand years ago. Get yourself heard. Get yourself talked about by talking, by telling the story, by um, you're putting yourself in front of in front of someone who might be interested in hearing what you've got to say it's it's obvious advice and it's 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 even more difficult in the case of the lockdown but that's the only thing but actually the best thing to do is write as well as you possibly can write the best book you can with all the skill you've got Accept that it won't be perfect because you're still learning. We're all still learning. I'm still learning. Accept that it won't be perfect, but don't worry about that. It's better to be out there and read um, uh, than not be out there at all. Just, just write and think and go to the same, go to your desk at the same time every day. Fantastic advice. Another question from Louette Harding. Do you expect the most penetrating literary interrogation of the long-term effects of the current crisis and its handling by politi various political leaders, which we mustn't start you on because we haven't got the time, um, to come from children's or young adult writers? Oh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Um, it's, it's too soon yet for us to write about the, the, this this virus with a chance of seeing it in full and don't forget um stout cortez had to wait what was it 300 years before keats 
wrote about him in that poem, Silent Upon a Peak in Darien. So there's no need to be in a hurry about this if you're writing fiction about it. Take your time. Um, explore it thoroughly from, your, from the position of where you are. Learn what you can, read what you can, talk to who you can manage to talk to. But don't hurry. Um, novels aren't best written in a hurry unless you're Georges Simenon, who managed to bash out a maigre in seven days or whatever it was. But, but I don't think we should expect anything yet. It's too soon, as um, whoever it was, Cho En Lai, said when asked what he thought were the results of the French Revolution, he said it's far too soon to say, and that was, what, um, 150 years after it. Uh, it is too soon for us to say what the effect of coronavirus will be. This is another children's one, and something's interesting because I know you've had a, a you've been always been very anti age ranging. But mm. one of the questions that someone asked you uh, from Josephine Chia is when you're writing a children's book, do you keep the age of your reader in mind? No, I don't. Um, I don't. I don't think of the readers at all. I know publishers and other well-meaning people will say think of your readership think what they can understand and write in language that's suitable for them and stay away from this or that topic because they're not ready to process it yet um i my advice has always been ignore all that it's none of their damn business what you're writing until you until it's finished write what you want to write write it as well as you can don't think of the readership because it's none of their business, as I say, until it's out there in the bookshops. This is a two-stage, there's a two-stage political process here. Writing a book is being a tyrant, being a dictator, a despot. Um, you don't listen to anyone, you, you ignore every kind of advice, you do it exactly what you want to do, and you kill off characters, you change the punctuation, you do anything you want to, because you're the boss. But when the book is published, and out there in the bookshops, as we hope, um, the whole thing changes. It becomes democratic. Each person who reads the book is entitled to think what they think, what they want about it. They're entitled to stop reading if they don't want to. They can throw it away and say what a lot of rubbish. They can write to you and complain. They can write to the bookshop and the publisher and complain. They can write a steaming review. They can do anything they like and you can't control them because it's democratic. You don't know what the reader is going to bring to it. And that's the other thing, because everybody reads a book in a different way, because we all have different experiences. Experiences not, in, not only of life, um, you know, the difference between a 70 year old reader and a 15 year old reader is quite considerable in terms of what uh, life experiences they've got. But in terms of temperament as well, um, someone might be temperamentally optimistic and, um, um, you know, in, 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 in inclined to Boo, boo your ideas of um, how everything is a mess and the world is going to rack and ruin. Somebody else might be uh, inclined to agree with that. And, uh, you know, we, we, we don't know. We don't know why people read their books. You might have thought you've written a searing indictment of the um, arms trade and they read it for the love story. You don't know. It's democratic. And that's how it should be. The meaning of a book isn't a, a sort of gem that's carried intact from your wonderful mind into the pages of the book, into the, into the reader's mind, unchanged. It isn't. It only emerges when the reader reads the book and the, the conversation between the reader and the book is where the meaning lies and where the meaning is, is, um, is, is born. And a very different question. You must have had an almost an infinite number of highlights, but what's been your favourite incidents or experiences during your writing career? One of, I think we'd better say. <laughs> the best moment of all was in 1993 when I was just beginning to write Northern Lights, the first part of his Dark Materials. And I'd, I'd found this idea of the demon, that, that, that Lyra has a demon. And so do the other people. What, what does that mean? I thought I didn't know what it meant. And because I didn't know what it meant, I didn't want to carry on blithely because it had to be expressive. It had to express something important to do with the story. And since I hadn't written the story yet, I didn't know what the story was about, really. 
So I wandered about and I, I was wandering through the garden of the house we lived in then. And I can remember the very stone I was standing on in the path when the idea came to me, children's demons change and adults' demons don't. And that was the moment I saw the key to how the whole story would work and develop. And it was the most exciting thing that I remember ever happening to me, better than winning any prize or getting any large check or whatever it is. Those things are nice and important and very good. But this was the best thing because it had to do with what I was making, with what I was doing. What am I trying to say? What you put in the book should be expressive of something. Every, every art form is expressive in one way or another. And if you, um, if you, if you introduce a, a, a strand or an image or something into your story that doesn't express anything in particular, not only won't it do anything, it'll actually actively get in the way. And I, I, I knew enough about writing stories by then to realise that if, if, if this demon idea didn't express anything, it would just get in the way. It would be annoying and fiddly and, and I'd get fed up with it. Um, but because I had I hadn't come across, I hadn't sort of put the theme, the theme of the book into words yet, but I realised it was going to have something to do with growing up, with the difference between being a child and being grown up. And here was a vivid image, a picture of it. And this is what I could do with the demon. That, I promise, is the most exciting thing, moment that ever I've ever experienced as a storyteller. There's a moment of inspiration. It's, it's wonderful. There's a number of questions you've been having here um, about translation. What What is your relationship with, with many translations? Presumably the, the books have been now done in many languages. What relationship do you have with your translators, if at all? Um, I've only ever met one of them, and that's the French translator, Jean Esch, whom I like very much and who does a terrifically good job. My, my French editions are really, really good. But I couldn't judge a, a translation into um, uh, Latvian or um, you know, Chinese or, or, or Turkish. I'm in no position to judge. What you have to do is to trust the um, agent and the publisher. And the publisher signs a contract which says something like he promises to make a full and faithful translation of the book. And you have to accept that. And um, sometimes it might be and sometimes it might be rather less than that but you don't know um, do you ever have dialogue with them coming back to you asking you what um, do you think they can translate from that? very seldom uh there was one occasion with my spanish translator who wanted um to, to ask a particular question i've forgotten what it was anyway i i answered it for him and uh, uh, and that went all right a, a related problem not quite the same is titles now the secret commonwealth my latest book um, is a particularly good title, which I stole from a book called, oddly enough, The Secret Commonwealth. Um, and I think in the book, um, I, use it, I use it to refer to th the world of shadows, shadowy things, ghosts, things seen at twilight, things not fully understood, all that sort of stuff, fairies, that kind of things. And I, it's called The Secret Commonwealth because I particularly, well, I like the idea of there being a um, a sort of commonwealth, a, a, a federation, if you like. But the word commonwealth means, for example, to a French audience, means specifically the British Commonwealth. They don't have an equivalent of the word commonwealth in, in French. So I think they've had to call it the secret community or something, which isn't ideal. But um, again, titles aren't fully under your control, at least under mine anyway. The, the American version of Northern Lights, for example, is called the Golden Compass, which I don't like and never have done because it isn't a compass, the Aletheon, it's something else. Um, uh, but, but some countries like um, um, Italy have called it the Golden Compass and other countries have called it, like Spain called it Northern Lights. So some do, and some, the French, of course, are law unto themselves. They still call it something different, the Royaume du Nord. But that's for the French for you. Now, I know we've got so many questions here, but I also am well aware we're over time. I've gone over time because we had difficulties starting, but I really think I probably ought to wind up and ask one last question, which sure. is from Pat Hall, who said, do you always need to know exactly what happens to your characters before you start to write the novel? Or do you sometimes find characters going a different way to the way you'd planned? Well, if, if, if they don't go a different way, I want to know why. 
Um, no, I don't. I don't plan. I don't plan anything at all beyond the vaguest sort of. It would be quite nice if she. It would be quite nice if she went to Central Asia. Feeling, um, in his dark materials, I thought vaguely that she ought to go north. There you are. That's all I knew. Um, I. Very early on in my career, I tried to make a plan of a book because I sort of thought that that's what writers did. And I read interviews with people who talked about their, the plan and the book and all this. So I made a plan for a book and I, it took about three months. It was a very good plan and, and I couldn't write it. I was so bloody bored. I'd had it up to there with the damn thing. So I threw it away and then started another book with no idea what was going to happen. And I've always stuck to that. It fills me with um, regret, despair, despair, pity, when I hear teachers and, 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 and school syllabuses say, always make a plan before you write, write your plan first and then write the story. And I always, always tell them to do it the other way around, write the story first and then make the plan, because then you'll know what you've got and what you can cut out and what you need to add to. Uh, besides, if you do it that way around, you'll get the, the story will be just like the plan and you get more marks. <laughs> But, 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 but more, more seriously, no, I don't make a plan. I don't know what they're going to do. And it always, it always delights me when a character does something that I didn't expect or says something too witty for me to have thought of myself. So um, it's nice to have that element of autonomy and agency in one's own characters. Yes, that's fascinating. Thank you so much, Philip. You've been, as always, passionate, insightful, delightfully self-deprecating as if, as if your books have nothing to do with you. So thank you on behalf of me, on behalf of all authors for today, for all you do for everybody, for the speaking out you do. Um, thank you to everybody who listened in. To remind everyone again that all sessions are free, but if you could afford to give a donation to the Authors Emergency Fund, we'd be very grateful. And don't forget to join us next week when I'll be speaking to Roger McGough. Um, and also head to the Society of Authors events page to see what other events we've got coming on. Um, it's been lovely to see everyone here. It's been lovely to have tea with you, Philip. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, thank you all for visiting and cramming into this little tiny room, um, 490 or whatever it was, people. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. And if you've heard some of my jokes before, well, I haven't got very many. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.